cold and damp October morning, English and French forces marshalled up against each other across the muddy fields of Agincourt, with drastically different hopes and predictions for the bloody battle to come. King Henry V had marched his men across northern France, through hostile territory to stake his claim to the throne of his rival, though now his beleaguered army hoped only to escape. Cut off from the only route home, they would be forced backs against the wall into a nation-defining confrontation. At this point, estimates begin to widely vary for the actual size of both French and English forces in the field, though most estimates place the English army in the range of around 8,000 men, having lost many to disease and desertion along the desperate trail from Harfleur. The army consisted almost entirely of longbowmen, making up 80% of the ranks, with the remainder being a mixture of men-at-arms and dismounted knights. The shift in archers to infantry ratio from the beginning of the campaign is likely due to the high infantry costs required when taking Arfleur and other skirmish fighting up until this point. While many of the English knights in fact retained their horses at this point, Henry decided that the dismounted troops would prove to be more advantageous in the defensive battle that he intended to engage in. Numbers on the French side vary even more drastically, likely because of the old adage that history is often written by the victors. Most realistic opinions pin the number of French forces down to around 14,000 men that were actually brought to bear in the battle, with reinforcements reaching the rear of the army day by day from local levies. Though it is likely that due to being in friendly territory, the French force had a large number of non-combatant camp followers that would have been visible at the battle behind the rear line, possibly explaining the many large estimates for the real size of the French army. However, these untrained and lightly armed followers would likely have proved little use against any real soldiers, and therefore can be largely discounted as any real part of the army. Contrasting with the English, the French lines were made up almost entirely of men-at-arms and knights, with only around 1,500 archers and 500 crossbowmen to complement the 9,000 heavy infantry and 3,000 heavy cavalry. It is likely that the French army may have had larger contingents of archers available in the rear, though most lords saw little need to deploy these normally reservist troops. The terrain on the battlefield would also make it difficult to deploy any more soldiers in the lines, forcing the French to deploy an equally strangely composed force to the English. The armies deployed in the fields of Agincourt, with the French army at the northern end of a narrow pass between two dense forests, and the English army spread out at the southern end of the pass, ready to meet them. In order to reach Calais, Henry needed to break through this location and continue his march north. On the day of the battle, Henry and his personal retinue of man-at-arms positioned themselves in the center of the English line. He gave a hopeful speech to his men, encouraging them to think back on great victories of the past, touching the hearts of his soldiers who rallied around him. His cousin Edward, Duke of York, on the right flank, and Baron Camoys commanding the left flank. The English infantry were positioned in a spread and shallow formation to cover as much distance as possible from woods to woods with the vast numbers of archers in the army spread out from the western woods near the village of Agincourt to the eastern woods around Tramcourt. The archers drove thick wooden stakes into the ground in front of their line, providing a makeshift defense against cavalry charges. The French force organized itself into three main lines, led by the respective three commanders. Their troops packed into close formation to fill the narrow pass with as many swords as possible. The first line, consisting of a central body of dismounted men-at-arms, flanked and backed by the small numbers of archers and crossbowmen, with the wings of the line protected by units of mounted men-at-arms. The second French line consisted largely of more heavy infantry, flanked again by an array of heavy cavalry units. The third French line consisted of the remainder of all fighting units, both a large number of heavy infantry backed by lines and lines of heavy cavalry. Similar to the previous day, Henry expected a French advance into his line, though no such attack would come. After several hours of awaiting, Henry was forced instead to move his forces upwards to begin the engagement himself. Bucco, an experienced commander himself, recognized this strategic advantage and remained in position deciding to take the advantage of defender for himself. Their forward march forced the English archers to abandon their dug-in position, 
uprooting the stakes, leaving them totally vulnerable to a cavalry charge. However, the French force remained stationary as Henry moved his line forwards, unwilling to make the first move. This may have been due to the French commanders underestimating the potential effective range of the experienced longbowmen making up Henry's force, and instead expecting the English to eventually be forced into a charge of their own line. However, this was not to be. Just as the English longbowmen got into their maximum range at about 400 yards, Henry commanded the redigging of their defences, and before the French line could reorganise from their tight formation and react, the hail of arrows began. The English longbows could unleash a devastating 12 arrows per minute from their heavy duty bows. Though a charge did come, with the flanking heavy cavalry forming ranks and charging the centre of the English line. Though by the time the French men-at-arms had reached the English, many tens of thousands, perhaps even more than a hundred thousand arrows had been loosed into them. This deadly rain of arrows struck down any rider in less than the best armour available, and cut through lightly armoured horses with ease. The small numbers of vanguard riders that in fact reached the English line found their horses spooked by both the thick line of stakes and the bloodbath surrounding them causing many to flee in terror and the few who remained to be cut down after being pulled from their horses or shot at close range with high poundage bows. The frontal cavalry charge quickly dissolved, with the French units being totally destroyed or routed from the battlefield, with both horses and riders charging back and forth through the pass into their own lines. The sight of some of the proudest and most well-equipped soldiers in the French army being cut down and running away cast fear into the minds of many of the French infantry, who just hours before had been so brimming with confidence that many high-ranking aristocrats had fought each other to be on the front line, hoping to capture as many English prisoners as they could, though the true nature of the battle slowly began to dawn on the French infantry as the main lines were ordered to advance. The French first and second lines became even more compacted as they marched into the pass, hoping to simply reach and crush the English centre with their vastly superior numbers. The continued hail of English arrows cut into the lines, bringing down large numbers of French troops as they trudged across the field. Many sources indicate that the large numbers of French forces were not even equipped with shields to protect the line from the storm of arrows as many would have been dismounted knights who preferred the use of larger, twin-handed weapons, and many simply believed that their plate armour would protect them from the light arrows. However, this would not be the case. The average middling quality heavy plate armour used at this time may have been penetrated directly even at ranges of up to 200 yards, making huge numbers of the French line totally unprotected from the waves of arrows that crashed down upon them. The French crossbow and archer contingents, by contrast, became packed in with much of the infantry, making it almost impossible for their small numbers, lower ranged equipment, and dense formation to prove any effective covering fire for the advancing first line. It is very likely that due to their light or even non-existent armour, these troops would have been the first to fall, taking the brunt of the English attack. The advance of the French line was slowed dramatically by the churned up mud and arrow storm falling upon their heads, with men falling in the first rank forcing their comrades to walk over the wounded and corpses of those who they had been carousing alongside the night before. This bloody onslaught was not the norm of many battles, especially for the highborn in the line. With most battles being a slow melee pushing match of sorts, the particularly bloody nature of the advance caught many of the men-at-arms off guard, causing morale throughout much of the line to begin to waver. Though, by this time, any hopes to retreat was impossible. The infantry coming from the rear and the now advancing second line pushed the backs of the terrified French infantry, forcing them ever closer into the jaws of the English line. With helmets and visors down, they could see little other than the mud and blood several feet in front of them, the thick whistling hail of arrows falling, pricking their ears with shrill screams and shouts of fellow soldiers being struck down around them, as they pressed the fallen bodies of the flanking cavalry wounded horses and men still calling out, sinking into the mud. Packed shoulder to shoulder, they forced themselves to advance through the withering fire. As the lines clashed, it is clear that there remained little organisation in the French line, likely with many of the commanders being already wounded or dead from the storm of arrows. 
the lightly armoured longbowmen of the English were capable of outmanoeuvring the exhausted and demoralised French infantry, with many reaching for axes and short swords darting into the almost collapsed French line to cut down and capture the faltering soldiers. The English groups of men-at-arms, by contrast, were fresh, and with able memories of a long march and the losses of our fleur clear in their minds as Henry himself charged into the battle. Equally equipped, the relatively small numbers of English men-at-arms had little trouble against the still vast numbers of French, giving small amounts of grounds as they peeled back, allowing the dug-in archers on their flanks to continue the fire of arrows into the sides of the French formation. With their king fighting at their side and nowhere to run, the English line held out against the mass of French forces, at one point the king's brother Humphrey becoming wounded and drugged back to the rear while Henry continued the fight. As the French advance ceased, the second line joined the fray, crushing into the backs of the first, many of which were attempting to retreat by this point. Despite the superior numbers of the French force, the close terrain made the second line barely able to engage, forcing the main mass of the French army to remain stationary, packed together surrounded by their comrades, as arrows continued to rain down upon them from the elevated positions of the English archers stationed in the woods. Thousands of French soldiers fell, being struck dead and taken prisoner by eager English archers, though at this point came a grim reminder of the nature of the battle. With large amounts of prisoners being pulled back behind the lines, Henry began to fear his force would lose the momentum they had just gained, and that the French third line, still relatively fresh with large numbers of heavy cavalry, would capitalise on this weakness. He gave the order to execute all prisoners that had been taken. It is argued as to what proportion of the captives were actually executed, though the sight of those who were was clearly enough to strike fear once again into the rallying French force. At this point, any remaining French pockets of organisation dissolved into a rout. The remainder of the front line collapsed, being taken prisoner or cut down in the thousands, as many turned and ran, their commanders already long dead or captured. The French third line and camp followers watching from the rear retreated from the field, having never engaged in the fight, and with this, the Battle of Agincourt was won, leaving King Henry and his army free to march north, completely uncontested.